Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm gonna to be talking about PFTs or pulmonary function testing. So this is gonna be a respiratory video. If you wanna know more about PFTs, stick around and you'll find out more. Hey guys, I'm Daniel from Doldier Media and thank you guys for watching. I'm gonna be talking about PFTs today. PFTs are something that a lot of people aren't too familiar with unless they work in the hospital or have been diagnosed with some kind of pulmonary issues. So I'm gonna to explain to you guys what a PFT is and I'm gonna to try to narrow it down to when a respiratory therapist is most likely gonna encounter PFTs. Pulmonary function tests are ways of diagnosing respiratory issues. What they are is, as you see in this graph right now that it's on the screen, it's a way of measuring volumes that are forced out and you're forced to breathe out and breathe in. Now what these volumes do is tell us a, actually a lot of information. Pulmonary function tests tell pulmonologists a lot about what's going on inside of the lungs. Like we just saw in the graph posted above, I'm gonna go over a little bit more details in a second, but before I go over that, I'm gonna talk about what pulmonary function tests tell people that have been diagnosed with some kind of uh, respiratory condition. So if you have emphysema, for example, you're gonna get a PFT done. And what that PFT is gonna tell us is how well you're able to breathe out. In a span of one second, we should forcefully be able to breathe out 80% of all the air that was in our lungs. Now, if we're not able to in one second breathe out 80% of the air that's in your lungs, then there's some kind of obstruction. And that's when we call it a uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. And if you're consistently getting this where you're not able to breathe out 80% of the the volume that's in your lungs forcefully over one second, then you have an obstruction. How we measure the severity of the obstruction is actually determined by how much can you breathe out. Typically what happens in a PFT is you go inside of a closed room and every single particle of air is calculated and accounted for. And when you take a deep breath in, and then when you take a deep breath out, the actual measuring device is able to tell exactly how much air you breathe out forcefully. So if somebody's only able to breathe out in the first second 20% of the air, then they have very severe COPD. Here's a graph that's telling us exactly what level you're at and what does that tell the practitioner. Typically, it tells you what kind of medication you need to take. You might ask yourself, 80% of what? How do you get the number 80% of what and how much do you know you're supposed to breathe out? Well, that's actually based on your height, your age, and even your sex. There is a number that's set for your demographic that's gonna tell you exactly how much you should be breathing out in one second. And if you're only breathing 80% of that number, then that's how we classify that you're only able to breathe 80% of that number. Now on the other end, let's say you have a pulmonary interstitial lung disease, uh, some kind of pulmonary fibrosis, or there's just a number of conditions you can get from some kind of fibrosis or uh, what happens is you actually get fibers built up in your lungs and those fibers create the lungs to be so stiff that you're not able to take a deep breath. Well, the way we determine that you have this problem is the total lung capacity or even the amount you're able to the inspiratory capacity. One of those numbers is going to be a lot lower. So your capacity to breathe in is going to be greatly diminished. And that's going to tell us that there's some kind of a restrictive disorder going on. I'm using the word restrictive and obstructive, and these are two ways that we classify respiratory diseases. There's five diseases that people get that are obstructive, everything else is most likely restrictive. And that tells us what kind of problem you have. If you have a restrictive disorder, that means that you're not able to breathe air in. Uh, you have very stiff lungs, very tight lungs, and the way we treat that is differently than if you have obstructive lungs. If you have obstructive lungs, that means you can get air in easily, but you have a really difficult time getting it air out because there's some kind of obstruction. And that obstruction is usually uh, your bronchi, your bronchiole, or something collapsing, getting uh, inflamed, or something happening along the lines where you're not able to breathe the air out. A side note with that is, if you're listening to somebody's lungs using a stethoscope and you're trying to auscultate to see what kind of breath sounds they have, typically a restrictive lung is gonna sound like Velcro. Uh, it's the shoes that people have and you could hear that like almost fine crackle. If they're obstructive, you're most likely gonna hear a wheeze or almost diminished breath sounds. The one time where people get thrown off is in cystic fibrosis. 
It's actually an obstructive disease, but because the breath sounds are crackles due to the actual disease process itself, uh, people confuse it for fibrosis. So that's why it's called cystic fibrosis. Now there is scar tissue that does happen, but it's an obstructive disease. If you're in respiratory school or you just graduated from respiratory school, or even if you're in any, any other medical field, a good acronym to remember, or at least pseudonym, acronym, pseudonym, it's one of them. Uh, a good little mnemonic device, uh, it's not pseudonym, I just thought about that. A good way to remember the five obstructive diseases is with C, babe. And that's going to be cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema. Those are the five and only obstructive diseases there are in the respiratory system. And those are going to be measured and calculated with the inspiratory capacity or forced vital capacity. So normally under these circumstances, you're going to be taken to a pulmonary function test. Uh, it's usually in an outpatient setting. It's not going to be in a hospital. Uh, you're going to get put in a box and you're going to be forced to breathe uh, as hard as you can in, as hard as you can out a few times. And that's going to tell the doctor exactly what kind of disorder you can have. It's pretty fascinating because it always works. Um, that's one way of objectively seeing what disease process a patient has. Now, along with uh, outpatient settings of PFTs, uh, sometimes as a practitioner, you're going to have to do a PFT, a bedside spirometry test in the hospital. Um, you might have to do this probably once every few weeks, sometimes a little bit more frequent. And the patients that you'll do that most often with is going to be a cystic fibrosis patient, whether it's a pediatric or an adult, uh, they're probably gonna have a PFT done, bedside spirometry done, before they come in and get admitted to the hospital or upon admission and right before they leave because we wanna see that there's improvement in all the numbers. And a few other cases that a PFT might be done is if you work in a trauma hospital, you're gonna wanna get a PFT done if the patient has some kind of uh, spinal cord injury and they're not able to breathe to the fullest capacity. Uh, in my practice, I've had a few people that lost the ability to walk after car accidents and we had to every single day measure a trend to see if they're able to still breathe forcefully as much as they were able to and if their inspiratory capacity was the same when they got admitted. So you kind of after a period of a few weeks see a trend and see if they're getting any better or worse. And if it's staying the same, then they're probably gonna be good outside of the hospital. The other two times you're most likely gonna do this at a hospital is gonna be with somebody who has myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre, Guillain-Barre. I'm kidding, it's Guillain-Barre. Myasthenia gravis is a neurologic disorder that it's almost fascinating how it happens because it's genetic in some parts and we don't know much about it. But myasthenia gravis or mind to ground is when you start losing motor function of your skeletal muscles and it starts off with people not being able to chew or swallow properly and it goes on to the, the actual phrenic nerve and they stop the ability to breathe. In patients that have Guillain-Barre, it's the opposite. It's ground to brain. It starts off with the feet, people stop walking and then eventually the nerve problem goes all the way up to the, again, to the breathing muscles and to the diaphragm. And so in both of these patients, the biggest concern is their ability to breathe. And the only way to objectively measure their ability to breathe is with a force vital capacity or an FEV1, which tells you exactly how much they're able to breathe and what their overall capacity is to breathe. With the PFT or a bedside spirometry for a Guillain-Barre patient and a myasthenia gravis patient, you might also do a NIF. Uh, some places call it different names, but a negative inspiratory force. Uh, what you do is you have a patient breathe on a manometer and they inhale as hard as they can and it tells you how strongly they could breathe in which indicates how well they'll be able to cough. If they cannot, if there's a trend downwards where their numbers keep getting smaller and smaller, that means that they're gonna need to get intubated because they cannot protect their airway. Um, the same applies for Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis. If we start seeing a downward trend and the overall capacity, uh, the two, it might indicate two things. Either the person who's doing the test is not doing a good job and you need to be a little bit better at motivating the patients or they need to get intubated. And this is quite often you'll, the case with p patients that have this disease. And just to kind of summarize what I was talking about earlier about FEV1s 
FEV1 is forced expiratory volume over one second. Um, there are other measuring tools that are, you're gonna have to study them for your boards if you're gonna take a test. And if you're working in the field, you're gonna see these numbers, but they're not gonna tell you as much. The number one number that really kind of matters to somebody like me is FEV1. And again, if you have 80% and above, that means you're good. If you're at 60 to 80, that means you have a mild disorder. If you're at 40 to 60, you have a moderate disorder or moderate COPD or stage two COPD. And if you're anything less than 40%, then you have pretty bad, severe COPD. Each of these stages, mild, moderate, and severe, have not only a different way of giving medications to a patient and dealing with the problem, but it also sheds light on how bad their exacerbation is gonna be. So if somebody has mild COPD and they come in and they're saying they're short of breath, you're gonna be pretty worried. You're gonna give them the standard continuous nebulizer. You're gonna to try to treat them. But if on their record it says they have severe COPD and they're complaining that they can't breathe, you're gonna be a little bit more worried and you're probably gonna be thinking about intubation as soon as possible. If you are watching this and you're in respiratory school or you're just about to take your NBRC or your boards, questions you might get on your NBRC exam or your TMC if you're trying to become an RT might be along the lines of um, determine what kind of stage this patient is based on this uh, pulmonary function test or calculate the over Overall total volume capacity uh, which is you just pretty much add all the numbers up uh, there weren't too many questions in terms of the actual and analyzing or explaining what the numbers mean there was a lot more questions that had to do with the physics behind how the numbers are attained uh, such as using Boyle's law or Gay-Lussac's law in physics there was also a lot of troubleshooting questions as to what might this indicate or how do we fix this problem. And that is something that you should definitely study if you're about to take a test. Thank you guys for watching. This was a respiratory video. If you guys want more information on other things such as BiPAPs or ABGs, watch some of my other videos that are gonna be linked above. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe to my channel and like if you like this content. Have a good day.